next speaker is Bill Marovitz. Bill served 13 years as an Illinois state senator and became particularly notable for advocating tough gun controls, especially for that uh, windy, rowdy, legendary city of his, Chicago, where he subsequently became a developer and a restaurateur. Now, we lucked out <coughs> with the senator in two ways. First, he came to our attention as the spouse of one of our booked speakers. He is Mr. Christy Hefner. And I'm sure he's proud of it. And secondly, secondly, there was that awful, baffling, depressing double shooting the other day, right? When was it? Last Friday. And those kinds of murders are so deeply at odds with our idea of ourselves. And so I turn to the senator and I say, what's going on with the guns here? It's a new phenomenon for us. Can anything be done to control them? Would you come up and give us a hand? Thank you, Moses, and it's a pleasure to be here. There are 300 million guns in circulation in the United States. As you can see from the, uh, from the slide, handguns account for the vast majority of gun-related crimes and gun-related deaths. Now, I'm going to put a breakdown up here, just some statistics that I've compiled so that you can see things that are going on around the world. Over 30,000 Americans are killed by guns, at least in 2005, and that's the last year it was compiled. And that's an increase from, uh, from the year before. Every year it's been going up. Uh, just imagine the audacity of a legislator, of a senator, trying to do something to curb the proliferation of guns, gun violence, and gun deaths. Uh, you would think that it was a, a, a novel idea to try and bring about some kind of constructive change. The homicide rate is three times higher in homes with guns. It's just a basic fact that if you have a gun in a home, there's a better chance for an accident or a better chance for a homicide. Now, I took a look at some statistics in Canada, and I thought I'd put them up on the board. The risk of firearms death is three times greater um, in the United States. And the U.S. gun homicides are eight times higher than in Canada. I've done a lot of work regarding guns and kids, and I think that's uh, one of the saddest uh, topics that I could talk about in, in, in regards to gun and the gun proliferation. In 2005, over 3,000 Americans under 19 were killed with firearms. And this means an average of eight Americans, eight kids a day, are killed with firearms. Seven out of 10 American kids killed with guns are killed with a gun that's stored in their own home or home of a friend or relative. And 50% of the guns are not even stored, are not even secured. I want to tell you a, 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 a little story about uh, a bill that I introduced. It was called the Child Accident Prevention Bill. And it said that uh, if you have a gun in your home, and there are small children likely to gain access to that weapon, that you would have to secure that weapon somehow, some way. Put a trigger lock on it. Put it under lock and key or combination lock. Common sense. Well, I was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and the bill that I introduced went to my committee. Just so happened. And uh, my colleagues and uh, other lobbyists were lined up in favor of the, this common sense legislation. But of course, the NRA, National Rifle Association, registered against the bill. So when they came to testify against the bill, I said to them, what's, what's your argument? He said, well, we think the penalty is too stiff. It was a felony. I said, well, then let me ask you a question. In the spirit of compromise, I'm not trying to put somebody in jail here. I'm trying to save lives. In the spirit of compromise, if I reduce the penalty from a felony to a misdemeanor, will you withdraw your opposition 
from this well-meaning legislation. And the NRA lobbyists said, if you reduce it from a felony to a misdemeanor, we'll reduce our opposition. We'll re we'll re we won't oppose this bill at all. So I did. I, I submitted an amendment, changed it to an, a misdemeanor, passed the bill out of the Judiciary Committee, went to the full Senate floor, and what do you think happened? The NRA opposed the legislation, talking out of both sides of their mouth, because that's who they are. Uh, in most U.S. states, gun dealers can sell any amount of guns to anybody, unless you're a minor. They can sell an AK-47. They can sell an Uzi. There's no limitation about the amount of guns that can be produced or who they can sell to. Uh, a gun runner can buy 100 firearms and sell, to, sell illegally to people who use those guns to commit crimes. So the proliferation of these guns, the lack of restrictions, is just untenable. In the United States, there's gun laws introduced every year in all 50 states. Some states have concealed carry uh, laws, which allow people to carry weapons on their person any place except schools or church. God bless you. Uh, but we're really not going to get anywhere in the United States by passing or trying to pass laws in 50 different states. If there's really going to be any meaningful gun control legislation, any meaningful effort to stop the proliferation of guns, it's going to have to be done at the federal level. It can't be done state to state. Now, I've put some figures up here that uh, will speak for themselves uh, about murder and the disparity of what goes on in the United States and what goes on in in other countries of the world. Among the top 36 industrialized nations, 86% of the gun deaths among kids, 86% occur in the United States. On average, there are approximately 90,000 firearm deaths every year among these 36 industrialized nations. One third of those, one third of those occur in the United States. So I guess the essential question is, why is there such a proliferation of guns in the United States? Why is there such a pervasive gun culture in the United States? And I think we have to start with this amendment, the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. And I'm going to read it even though you have it up there. A well-regulated militia, key word, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This Amendment, the Second Amendment, is the basis for much of the cons uh, con consternation and debate that goes on in the United States on this issue. Uh, the militia. Remember, this was passed in 1791. We were freeing ourselves from oppressive governments, and our forefathers, in their wisdom, thought, you know what? There may be an oppressive government, and we, have to, we the people, have to be able to arm ourselves. That was the purpose of putting in the well-regulated militia. The original intent of the framers was that there would be a collective right to bear arms. But this original intent, with the help of the NRA and the gun lobby, has morphed into an individual right, an unbridled individual right to bear arms. And that's, that's really dangerous. Now, courts have, have allowed some regulation. They've allowed ban on uh, assault weapons. They have prevented convicted felons from getting weapons. They've prevented people who have been convicted of domestic violence from getting weapons. But uh, it's very difficult, and the culture is very pervasive. The NRA has uh, three to four million members, and uh, it's the strongest lobby of any special interest group in the United States. They focus on punishment, but not proactive assistance to prevent crime. And that's really the danger. And uh, until, until the United States gets an organization that is powerful enough to counter the NRA so that elected officials won't be afraid to stand up to the NRA, they won't be afraid to prevent the broadening of this Second Amendment, they won't be afraid to stand up to this 
gun industry that is so profitable. Uh, until that happens, we're really not going to get change. When I was in the Senate for a long time, the right to life movement was um, the most powerful special interest group next to the NRA. And then some court decisions came down, the Casey decision, the Webster decision, and the women's movement got very fearful that the right to, for a woman to make her own choice was going to be abridged, Roe versus Wade was going to be chipped away, and the women's movement began to coalesce in much stronger numbers, much greater funding. And until that happened, the right to lifers pretty much controlled everything in the legislature. But as soon as that, those court decisions came down and the women's movement saw that their right to free choice was going to be jeopardized, uh, they got themselves together and they became a powerhouse. And I would say today, without question, the pro-choice movement is much stronger than the right to life movement in the United States because they stood up and they realized what was at stake. I don't think that, I'd like to stand up in here and, and say um, I'm uh, optimistic about uh, what's going to happen to gun laws in the United States. Uh, we'll stop the proliferation, we'll pass meaningful gun control. But I don't see an, I don't see an organization uh, on the horizon that can stand up to the, to the NRA. I don't see the citizenry being willing to, to hold their elected officials accountable and say, we don't want more kids to die. We don't want more Columbines where kids died in Colorado or Virginia Tech where kids and teachers died. Uh, just imagine those incidents and not being able to pass any meaningful gun control legislation in the face of incidents like that. In 1994, we passed an assault weapons ban in the United States. It had a provision that it would sunset in 10 years unless it was reenacted. 10 years went by and the assault weapon crimes diminished by 66% over that 10 year period. 2004 came, time to try and reenact the bill before it sunsetted. Not a chance. The NRA reared its ugly head, and legislators, members of the House, members of the Senate, were afraid to stand up and be counted and reenact the assault weapons ban. That's the sad story of the gun proliferation uh, situation in the United States of America. And again, we have an ideas festival. Elections can change the world. Elections can change the law, and I hope the coming election will make changes that will benefit all of us in the world at large. Thank you so very much. Well, you know, the baffling thing for us, Bill, is we have no NRA. The guns are flooding in on an illegal basis, and it appears to be primarily a youth crime. A lot of them are coming in, unfortunately, from the United States. We had the chief of police of Toronto in Chicago recently, and he was telling us about people going over the border, buying guns in pretty liberal states with liberal gun laws, able to purchase those, and bring, bringing them back, smuggling them back in here, and committing crimes. And, uh, you know, nobody lives on an island. What affects you affects us. What affects us affects you. And so all of us collectively are going to have to make a change. It can't happen in one state in the United States and maybe not even in one country. What happens in our, in our country is definitely affecting you. One continent. Thank you. Thank you. Most.